So with this, uh, allow me to say, dear Mr. Prime Minister, uh, Maris Kuczynskis, dear Mr. Uh, Minister of uh, Agriculture, Janis Duklovs, dear ASC uh, participants, warmly welcome to this year's annual science conference. While every year is special, and we acknowledge the huge efforts and resources that are invested in the arrangements of the annual science conferences, this year is indeed very special, as during this month, 23 years ago, Latvia acceded to the 1964 ISIS Convention and reinforced, so to say, their ISIS membership, which started in 1937. So we are today celebrating that anniversary uh, of the Latvian ISIS membership and the first hosting of Latvia of an annual science conference. Many thanks to you uh, for this. And I want to say that uh, on behalf uh, of the entire ISIS uh, community, and I want especially uh, to provide some thanks to uh, the Institute of Food Safety, Animal Health and Environment, and also uh, to the Latvian National Board uh, of Fisheries for the huge work and preparation uh, for this conference. Bordering on the Baltic Sea, Latvia has always been closely connected uh, with the sea, and I'm sure that we will see many examples uh, of this. And also uh, with this, I would like to give the floor uh, to uh, the Prime Minister, um, Maris Kuczynskis, for your welcome speech to this uh, annual science conference. Mr. Prime Minister, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, Minister, Congressional Conference Organizer and Dalibnik. Your Excellency, Mr. Minister, dear participants, ladies and uh, gentlemen, dear organizers. Zveja gadu simtiem ir bijus tradicionāla latviešu nodarbe. For centuries, fishing has been a traditional trade of Latvians. Jā, Latvijā zvejnieku un zvejas kuģu skaits pēdējos gados ir samazinājies. Taču tas ļāvis sabalansēt zvejas flotas kapacitāti ar pieejamiem zīvju resursiem un ilgspējīgas zvejas mērķiem. Although in the recent years the number of fishermen and fishing vessels has decreased, we have used this opportunity to strike a balance between the capacity of the fishing fleet and the available fish resources and the targets of sustainable fisheries. Zvejniecība Un ar to saistītā zīvju apstrāde joprojām ir svarīga Latvijas ekonomikas sastāvdaļa, un mēs esam ieinteresēti tās stabilitātē. Uh, fishing and the related fishing processing is still an important sector of Latvijas economy, and it is in our interests uh, to devote our efforts to stabilizing and providing the stability of the sector in future. Latvija kļūp par starptautiskās jūras pērtniecības padomes dalību valsti 1937. gadā un atjaunoja dalību tajā 1993. gadā. Latvija became a member of the International Council for the Exploration of the Sea in 1937 and we renewed our membership in the organization in 1993. Mums ir liels gods. Uzņemt pie mums šīs organizācijas zinātnisko konferenci, kas Latvijā norisinās pirmo reizi. It is our great honor to host the ISIS scientific conference here in Latvia, especially because it is the first time that we host such a conference here. Šodien zinātnieki vērtē ne tikai zvejas ietekmi uz zīvju krājumiem, bet arī to, kāda ietekme no cilvēku darbības tiek atstāta uz visu ekosistēmu. Today scientists estimate not only the impact of fisheries on fishing resources, but also assess how the anthropogenic activities influence all marine ecosystem. Arī mēs esam ieinteresēti, lai jūrā ir ne tikai daudz zivju, bet jūra būtu tīra, 
lai tā piesaistītu atpūtniekus mūsu pludmalēm un dabas bagātībām. And it is in our best interest to make sure that there is plenty of fish in the sea, but also that the sea itself is clean and is attractive for the tourists with its beaches and beautiful nature. Jūras resursu un pakalpojumu izmantošana ar katru gadu strauji pieauga, tāpēc nepieciešam to izmantošanas rūpīgu plānošanu. The utilization of uh, marine resources and services is going up every year, therefore we must have a very thorough approach to the planning of all the activities. Tādējād mēs sagaidām, ka konferences būs ievērojams zinātnieks notikums ne tikai ASES zinātniekiem, bet arī plašākais sabiedrības daļai. So therefore, we expect and hope that the ICES conference will be a significant scientific event, not only for the ICES scientists, but also for a wider society. Iecerēts, ka šajā konferencē zinātnieki iepazīstinās ar savu pēdējo pētījumu rezultātiem, kā arī izcevs svarīgākās pētījumu jomas un atsevišķi zināšanu trūkumu, kuri zivsēmniecības un jūris vidas zinātniskajiem institūtiem, Jāpievērš uzmanību tuvākajā nākotnē. And as usual, during such conferences, scientists not only present with their latest results from their studies and in investigations, what we can also expect from this conference is scientists highlighting the most important research fields for the future and revealing the knowledge gaps that will have to be addressed by scientific institutes in fisheries and marine sector in the nearest future. Sagaid, ka ICES konferences veicinās arī Latvijas zinātnes attīstību. Jauno zinātnieku iesaisti, paplašinās kontakts mūsu un ārvalstu zinātnieku starpā. So therefore we expect the ICES conference to also boost the development of a science sector here in Latvia. We hope that it will also promote the involvement of young scientists and will broaden our contacts and the cooperation with our foreign partners. Lai jums ražīgs darbs un pēc 10, 20 vai pat 50 gadiem zinātnieki ar atzinīgiem vārdiem pieminēt tieši Rīgas konferences rezultātus. So let me wish everyone a fruitful conference and hopefully in 10, 20 or 50 years from now scientists looking back at the Riga conference will only have praise about the outcomes of this conference. So have a good conference. Thank you. All this. Many thanks to Prime Minister uh, Kuczynskis. We know that it's a very busy day uh, and that it took a lot of planning uh, to be able to come here uh, during this first part of uh, the afternoon. And I'm sure that we will all strive to fulfill the wishes of the Prime Minister uh, and to look into both stability uh, for the fishery sector, the impacts of, uh, on the ecosystems, uh, the interaction with the society, and also ensure that we are getting a more, uh, that we are including also early career scientists in our work. Uh, with this, uh, I am now going to give the floor to our president, uh, Cornelius Hammer. Thank you, Anne-Christine. Dear hosts, Normans and George, dear colleagues and friends, ladies, gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to open this annual science conference, and I presume you wish to know what I, as your new president, plan to do and to receive within my term what I wish to put emphasis on, and what I stand for. My presidency falls into the mid to end period of our ambitious strategic plan, which is good, since it spares me the effort of designing a new one, and I can leave this conveniently to my successor. 
Apart from this, I'm very much in favor of our current strategic plan and the three big tasks in it, to which I subscribe very much. Firstly, there is the task of increasing ICE's efforts in the Arctic and to support actively the international Arctic activities. Throughout the past three years, we have come quite far in this respect, not at last because we have an extremely efficient and ambitious Arctic Fisheries Working Group and two working groups on integrated assessment in the Arctic and the Barents Sea, whose work I wish to bring to your attention here and to explicitly thank all working group members for their excellent work. On this occasion, I also wish to thank all countries supporting these working groups with logistics, surveys, scientists, and data, mainly Norway and Russia. We appreciate this greatly. Secondly, oops. Secondly, there's the big task to build up more competence and expertise in aquaculture. And within this huge field, especially regarding interactions, aquaculture, and the environment. For the coming years, it will be one of our objectives to make clients aware of the potential ISIS has and to encourage clients to make more use of the collective ISIS competence in this field. We are still, however, in the face of finding the right role and specific tasks of this working group, and I wish to encourage all who are interested in aquaculture to take part in actively shaping this working group. The third focus in uh, the strategic plan is on building up the integrated assessment, not only in the Arctic. We all know that fishing does not only take place on a particular stock, but takes place in an ecosystem. Our advice is in the process of growing from a single stock advice, amongst many other single stock advices, to a single stock advice within the context of an ecosystem. ICES is internationally on the forefront of, on, on, of this, and I think we are making good progress, but we still have a long way to go. This is challenging, but also scientifically extremely exciting and interesting. Apart from these three main goals of our strategic plan, there's another big issue for ICES to work on, and that is the transatlantic cooperation. In 2013, the Galway Declaration was signed between Canada, the US, and the EU in order to foster and increase the transatlantic cooperation in the field of marine science and marine research. ISIS is and always has been transatlantic cooperation in practice, and ISIS was asked to support this process. We are glad to do so. And many of our hundred, over 100 expert groups are contributing to this, while our Council Steering Group on Transatlantic Cooperation guides the process. However, in order to gain all your support, we will need to make this more transparent to the ISIS community and make you a part of it in order to get your buy-in and your support. I think we have not yet communicated this all well enough. So much about the big chunks on the plate. And while I was writing this, I asked myself how many of you can really relate to what I've said and know what I'm talking about. Some nearly 30 years ago, I was attending my first uh, ICES annual science conference. And I remember that I was sitting at the time in the very last row of a conference hall much bigger than this one. Um, and I listened um, to the pres president and his talk at the time. Though I understood the words perfectly well, they somehow did not make sense to me. I simply did not understand uh, exactly what he was talking about. I can't uh, recall uh, all the words he said, but probably it was about aims and visions and strategies and about structures and developments, something I talked about a minute ago. From my perspective as a brand new working group member at the time, he was talking about something that was certainly important to ISIS, but I could not at all relate to it. He was talking to someone, but he was not talking to me. I listened and watched the president on the podium with a gold chain around his neck, and I said to myself, if there's one good thing about my life, then it is that I will never, never, ever be president of ISIS and have to stand up front with a gold chain around my neck. Well, 
at least with regard to the chain, I was right. <laughs> Asking on that occasion those few I knew what it was about the president had been talking about, I received very evasive answers, and I realized they were on about the same level as I. A couple of years later, I felt strongly that IC's upper management layer was to some degree disconnected to the working group level, and I asked myself if there was some scope for reform. And there have been reforms since. In the past 10 years, we've been very busy re reorganizing ICES in a number of successive waves, and uh, with all ups and downs and pros and cons, we have achieved a lot. And we have solved a number of problems. Not all problems we have solved, though. I think that's normal. And new ones have emerged. For this reason, uh, the reforms have been a stepwise process. And the last step brought ACOM, SICOM, DATA, and the Secretariat much closer together. With the chairs of these and the uh, general secretary, we now have a, a very effective coordination group. We've come to a point that for the next couple of years, we have to test the new structure and see how it works in practice. To find exactly this out will be another task of my presidency. For this, I will take the liberty to leave the ivory tower once in a while, and I will pop up in meetings, maybe also in those to which I can't really relate scientifically. I will be sitting there and listen, and probably I won't be have to say much. But I will not be coming for talking and delivering, but I will be coming to listen and to receive. What I need for this is your opinion. What I need are your suggestions. What I need is your critique as well as your support. The basis and the heart of ICES are its expert groups. The purpose of the management is to provide the expert groups with good working conditions and to guide the process into a good direction. For this reason, I invite you all to come and talk to me, talk to us. Well, preferably not all at the same time. And with this, I wish you all an inspiring and fruitful annual science conference. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nils, also for giving this a little bit more of a personal uh, touch uh, and for stating that the need uh, to have a, a good communication, a good dialogue, uh, both with what sometimes is seen as the upper part of the pyramid, but uh, also to state that as a president, uh, you are aware uh, that we are uh, very dependent on what's happening within the community, uh, and it's uh, you as experts that are now participating in this annual science conference that is actually the identity and making up uh, ISIS as a community. And I think it was a very nice midterm report that we got on the status of the implementation of the ISIS strategic plan as well. Uh, we have now come to uh, the more entertaining uh, part of uh, this opening uh, ceremony. Uh, and I would uh, like now to introduce you to some music that we are going to listen to. Um, uh, and I have been asked to do this with a little introduction uh, as follows. So Latvians consider themselves as a singing nation. Their love for songs, um, uh, they express in numerous professional and, well, also they say non-professional uh, choirs. And the culmination is the National Folk Song Festival that is held once in five years and unite more than 10,000 people in a huge choir. And uh, this is why we today uh, are going to see and especially listen to one of the most uh, popular choirs in uh, Latvia um, and also abroad, I have been told, and it's called uh, Kamir, uh, and that in English means while. So with this, uh, we are waiting now for the choir to uh, enter the room.
I guess there's only one word that can describe that, and that was that that was absolutely beautiful, astonishing. Now, with that introduction, I think that we have set the scene um, very elegantly uh, to move to the next point, which is the Outstanding Achievement Award. And I would like to uh, give the floor to the chair of the committee who is considering uh, these uh, issues, and this is Pierre Pittiger. Thank you. So this is going to be a, a different uh, hymn. So the ICES has a, a recognition program that is run by the uh, awards committee, which uh, I currently chair. This year we're giving the uh, Outstanding Achievement Award. It uh, recognizes sustained outstanding performance in contributing to uh, IC science, leadership skills, continued commitment to helping to advance ICs as a dynamic international institution and enriching its community. It recognizes achievements in science, management, policy, and mentoring. And this year, we are giving this award to Peter Vibi, who is a... Uh, Peter Vibi is an outstanding zooplanktonologist. He's currently senior scientist emeritus at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution in the USA. He has been an active member of ICES for a long time, especially in the uh, working group of zooplankton ecology, which he still attends and has been attending for more than 25 years. He's also been instrumental in the development of two other groups, um, especially on the integrated morphological and molecular taxonomy, and because he values data on a group on data information and management. He's been key in developing the first groups on that subject that we have heard uh, a lot of this morning. Peter has always been at the forefront of new technology at sea. He started with very rudimental technology um, on the uh, left corner. He has been the father of the MOCNIS, which is a, a multi-net sampling the vertical distribution of zooplankton. You see another net, LHPR, which samples that as well. He has been involved in developing the BioMapper which is an instrument for integrated sampling of physics, phytoplankton, and zooplankton. He's been involved in the first uh, acoustic sampling of zooplankton, and you see him there sampling krill for volume measurements. But for zooplanktonologists, I guess it all ends up in jars. Peter values data. He has uh, made a lot um, of, of efforts to uh, make unpublished data available and to digitize historical data. And we see him here on uh, one of the first computers that, um, for the Mocknes. He has played a leading role in international programs and has put his science in a multidisciplinary context. He's been a very active uh, um, member of GLOBEC, of GIGOFS, of the International Oceanographic Commission. He's had many links with academia. He has put his work at the basin scale of the North Atlantic. And his colleagues say of him, he brings the European and the US scientific community closer together. And we see him here on a picture of a zooplankton symposium where you see people of Isis, Pisces, and Globec. 
He has a long list of publications. On the right, you see the Blue Bible, which is known as the Zooplankton Methodological Manual, where he's played an active uh, uh, editing role. He has been key in developing the, uh, on the uh, left, the Zooplankton Status Support, which is published every um, two years and spans over the, the whole North Atlantic. And recently, he's published in Progress in Oceanography, the saga of the zooplankton ecology group. He's a passionate person, has mentored many students that are now influential in the community. And you see him developing a special technique for mentoring, which uh, apparently has been uh, very uh, efficient. His colleagues serve him. He makes it makes joy to work with him. He is strongly interested, innovative, effective, persistent, focused, and realistic at the same time. He's always supportive, encouraging, solution-minded, and forward-looking. He views science altruistically. And this one, my continued discussions with Peter, especially over coffee breaks, were fundamental to my career. Peter will be around the whole week, and there will be coffee breaks, so <laughs> you might change your career this week. Here's a list of close support to Peter. Uh, there is a lot more out there, and it is my pleasure, Peter, on behalf of the ISIS community, to hand you over the award. Please come. totally overwhelming. Um, something I never ever expected to happen in my lifetime. So for a lifetime award, I think this is pretty special. Um, I've been involved in oceanography since 1962, when I started my graduate training at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And even then, I was involved in cross-disciplinary research as part of my thesis work, and as part of my education going to see with physicists and chemists and biologists. When I got to Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution in 1969, I immediately started doing cross-disciplinary research again because I discovered that there were these large eddy systems called Gulf Stream rings, which had never ever had anybody go out and actually take apart from a physics, chemistry, and biology point of view. And this is what I did with colleagues in the 1970s. We we focused on the ring, cold core rings, and then we went to the warm core rings. And then we built a bigger interdisciplinary team, more than 25 investigators and lots of different ships working simultaneously together. From there, it was to Globec and to the Global Ocean Ecosystem Dynamic System. And I was involved in uh, the first program on George's Bank, and I was also involved in the program in the Antarctic off the Western Antarctic Peninsula. Fantastic number of crews. In the, Gulf, in the Georges Bank program, which I was the actual executive committee leader for the program, we had more than 125 cruises in five years, all coordinated study in Georges Bank from a physics, chemistry, biology point of view, process-oriented, broad-scale sampling, mooring work, and so on. It's been an incredibly exciting time. In the early 90s, about the start of Globeck, Heinrune Schuldahl, who most of you probably know, invited me to start work in the working group. Actually, it was a study group for zooplankton ecology. And it was his vision of what needed to be done to bring the zooplankton community together and to foster its capabilities that led me to become a member of the study group, which then turned into the working group. And that working group has been really phenomenal uh, at providing 
a lot of guidance to the international community of zooplankton biologists, not just for the people in ICES, but for the whole global community. And it's uh, been a great pleasure for me to serve on that committee and uh, help foster the, the work of that committee and to think about what is needed for the future. There is one slide here that I wanted to show. Oops. Where'd it go? Is there somebody there that can put that? There it is. This is an indication of, um, this is a network picture of all of the people, well, actually, a subset of the people who have collaborated with me on different articles in peer-reviewed publications. 46 names here. The size of the dot indicates how many times I interacted with them. There's actually 216 different individuals in this network of, that I've worked with and published with. It's these people who have actually made it possible for me to do what I have done. And I hope that I've helped them as much as they've helped me. And I think it's really indicative of the kind of thing that now needs to be done in the future. Most good science is going to be done from a multidisciplinary perspective. It needs broad expertise from a wide number of different kinds of people working together. And uh, my career has been built on that, and I recommend it to you. So with that, I say thank you very much for this, this incredible honor. And I really appreciate the fact that I was singled out to receive it. Thank you. Yeah. A big congratulations to Peter Wiebe. And I think that it's always reassuring to know that already some years ago, we have actually been looking into transatlantic, multidisciplinary issues, and also been focusing on the importance of data in our work. We are now moving to our first open lecture. Uh, and it's my pleasure uh, to introduce Dr. Fritz Küster, uh, the uh, Danish uh, ISIS council member, also uh, first vice president uh, within Bureau, who is going to give us a lecture about understanding the processes behind fish stock dynamics. Where are we? Question mark. Fritz. Yeah, thank you, and Christine. Dear colleagues, and friends, deeply honored to have the opportunity to give this opening talk of the 2016 Annual Science Conference here in Riga. And that is both because I perceive the conference actually as the most important fisheries and marine science conference held annually. And secondly, because it is in Latvia. Since the early days of my career, I had intense collaboration with Latvian scientists, which has no doubt influenced my thinking, scientific work, and also the presentation. I agreed with the council delegates from Latvia to talk about understanding the processes behind fish stock recruitment, which is traditionally, really traditional, central part of fisheries research in Latvia, but also in the Baltic states in general. The talk, if I'm getting it moving, is touching first on the need and use of process understanding and fish stock assessment, forecast and setting target and limit reference points for fisheries management. This will be followed by examples of process understanding, both positive and negative ones. It will focus on classical key population dynamic rates, such as natural mortality growth, recruitment, but considering also ambient and environmental conditions and interaction with other ecosystem components. 
It does not focus very much on fisheries as a driver. That is not because it is unimportant, but because it is normally addressed in our assessment working groups. Secondly, we observe an increasing number of fish stocks in which recovery does not take place despite that fishing mortality is quite low. And that certainly warrants some closer investigation. Finalize, hopefully in time, with a summary. But start the show a little bit with uh, some definitions or terms so that we agree on what we are talking about. First of all, a process. What is a process? According to Webster's, it is a continuous action, operation, or series of changes taking place in a different manner. Biological processes, to say it short, are making nature dynamic. What is a fish stock? That's a population of fish belonging to a specific species, forming an independent reproductive unit, meaning having a common gene pool. What is fish stock assessment? Quoting Terence Quinn here, it is a scientific construct that integrates all relevant information and data with the important biological and ecological processes. And I think that is a quite modern definition, and I will try to see whether we are actually able to live up to that. Fish stock dynamics, we have the key population dynamic processes like recruitment, production of new fish, growth, individual growth, Mortality caused by fisheries or natural causes. And it is embedded in a multitude of layers which are interacting with fish stock dynamics. That is, for example, climate change to physiology, but it is also ecological interactions within the ecosystem as well as human impact on it. In relation to resource management, fish stock assessment is basically, as John Pope said it, counting fish. How many are there? And how many were there? Forecasts, how many fish will there be in future? Reference points, is the status of the stocks good or bad? Management, what when can we do about it? And there's absolutely no doubt that the process understanding needed to perform this pyramid is increasing as we are getting higher up in the level. Stock assessment, counting fish, is basically based on monitoring. Each and every input can be monitored. It is related to catch and catch composition relative abundances from research service or commercial fisheries, body size, maturity, length and age compositions, and natural mortality. The latter one is quite difficult to estimate, and normally we are assuming as a shortcut some reasonable constant value. Also a shortcut, survey catchability is often assumed to be constant. That's not always so. There are also stock assessment models which are able to estimate them. Next step is then we are performing short-term forecasts. These short-term forecasts are based on the present stock size conducted in the current year based on assumptions of natural mortality, maturity and growth normally set constant from previous years an array of assumed fishing mortalities, which we present the results in, and recruitment is normally observed in pre recruit surveys. That is building the basis for projecting the next year's stock size. If we then go a step longer in time horizon, medium to long-term projections, and in relation to that, determining reference points is based normally on stock recruitment relationships. That means recruitment plotted against spawning stock biomass, 
fitting some sort of function into it. Here we have two different examples. One of the shortcuts in our long-term projections is actually that the form of this shape is actually static over the prediction period. The second one is that spawning stock biomass is a proxy for egg production. I could also continue. A third one is that we are taking recruitment as output from stock assessment models. So it is recruitment into the fishable stock, which means that we in basics are jumping over a number of life stages, which is resulting in egg production, egg survival, larval production, young of the years into the fishable stock recruitment. If we are looking to relationships on stock recruitment, I tend to agree with Shepard and Cushing that in the absence of regulatory processes, the first assumption would be a strict proportionality, a straight line. Adding measurement error to both stock and recruitment might end in something like that, fitting a function through it, and something like that. That is something completely different than a straight line. It is actually estimating the production of juveniles at low box stock sizes, considerably higher, and it has a density dependent effect at high stock sizes. So one can imagine if one is using these two models in long-term projections or determining reference points that the output will be fundamentally different. So it actually matters what we are doing here. To summarize that part, when do we get concerned about process understanding? We are able to produce stock assessment and short-term forecasts without, basically without, process understanding if everything works. All are glad. If stock assessments or projections fail or management actions do not expect, show the expected impact, we get concerned. We need to understand why and what does not work. And what I'm now going to do is going through examples where we have problems, some examples where we have tried to solve them. I'm starting on a personal note. One of my first jobs was actually within the ISIS working group on assessment of cost, cost stocks in Greenland. I can crystal clear recall the working group meeting in Reykjavik in 1991, where our job was to assess the status of both East and West Greenland Cod. West Greenland Cod, at that point, we see the assessment output from the year before, was hinging on two abundant year classes, the 84 and 85 year class, which were the hope to rebuild the stock after a tremendous decline since the 1950s. When we looked in that working group, to the distribution of catches along the West Greenland coast, we got a little bit concerned because there was a clear-cut shift, southward shift of the landings from the commercial fisheries to the south. Looking to the German bottom trawl survey, distribution of 84-year class in 1985, that means as age group one, we had this picture. In 1990, we had this picture. So we get actually relatively fast the idea. What we see is actually a homeward migration of year classes actually produced in Iceland. I can recall at that point, I called home to the lab in Hamburg and asked them to dig out maturity data. When was it last time we had seen spawning of West Greenland on the banks, not inshore? It took a little bit of an excursion into the archives and they came back and said to me, you should know, you were the last one who has done the job some 10 years ago. <laughs> Basically, what that means is we were actually trying to assess a stock which did not exist anymore. And that was, as a young scientist, something which I definitely can recall today. Don't assess a stock without considering biological process driving it. There was a second one, which 
I think the Greenland example is giving quite good picture of what is actually happening. Time scale of the expansion of cod into West Greenland, the colonization from Iceland, that is minimum 20 years it took in the beginning of the 20th century and that without basically any fishing effort. So recovery may take a long time. Then the question, can that happen today? Is that standard? And then I would say no. I think that the quality and the information we have on our stock dynamics has considerably improved. And that is not only a question of being more aware of it, it is also a question of methodology. Here, first, as far as I know, application of combined data storage tagging and genetics for Northeast Arctic cod and Norwegian coastal cod. They are mixing during spawning time, and the job was to find out whether they are also using same feeding areas. We knew that is not the case, but how different is it? What we see here is the depth temperature profile during spawning, largely overlapping. In feeding and overwintering times, a clear tendency of being deeper and in more colder water. This type of data can actually be used to describe the spawning time, quantify migration rates, also look at individual variability and relate that to catchability, and describe the ambient conditions our cot is living in. For example, temperature for growth and consumption studies. Another advancement in methods to resolve stock structure is given here. It is in the Gulf of Maine, small-scale acoustic and tagging program, where a series of receivers was put into a spawning closure to observe spawning behavior of single cod. We see 24 hours compressed in 30 seconds. Color is shifting, or not color, but the lightness is shifting, reflecting day and night. The males are in green and the females in violet. And what you can see is a distinct difference in behavior with the males during night forming actually small territories, while during daytime they are also keeping apart. This strong fidelity to a particular spawning site is not only given within a spawning season, by repeating the exercise for several years, the group actually found out that they caught at least 50 to 95 percent of the surviving cod were exactly returning to the same place they were observed the year before. They made an exercise also to see what happens if a fishery is opening on such a spawning ground. And there is a clear catch impact of that. It changes the behavior. The fish which are not caught are leaving the area and they never return also not next year. That has an impact on our expectation of stock recovery. Spawning groups lost are not necessarily replaced by others. Robichaud and Rose in 2004 reviewed the available information on different Atlantic cod stocks, trying to figure out how many of those are actually dispersing and they found out that sedentary residents staying on a spot is about 60% of the groups they have looked at. And I think the number was about 300. Accurate homers, inaccurate homers, and dispersers were about 20%. That means only 20%, the last group, is actually the one who are good colonists. Now, what hampers recovery? If we are staying on the west side of the Atlantic, Canadian stocks, we all know that in the end of the 1990s and beginning of the, two, uh, end of the 80s and beginning of the 1990s, there was a tremendous decline in stock size, basically in all stocks, and no recovery since then. 
In 2000, DFO performed an international workshop on what they called the recruitment dilemma, reviewing stock by stock the available information which processes were actually hampering recovery. And the result is shown here. In four out of seven stocks, it is loss of spawner components. In six out of seven, it is reduction in growth and condition and reduction in recruitment. And in five out of seven, it is an increase in natural mortality. So basically, the message is those processes are not going alone. Most are affecting most stocks, if not all. Let's look a little bit closer into natural mortality. This is the Southern Gulf of St. Lawrence. The output of the assessment model, most recent, spawning stock biomass on this side. Fishing mortality, the red line, basically close to zero. That's the natural mortality increasing from the baseline 0.2 to 0.7. That means 50% removal per year in that stock in the absence of fishery. Who was blamed? The seals. There are about 140,000 gray seals foraging in the southern Gulf of St. Lawrence, and that's not a lot of an area. Benoit in 2011 made a calculation to find out how much seals would actually need to consume to explain such a mortality. At that point, it was a little bit less mortality. The answer was more than 20% of the diet composition need to be idle caught. And if looking into the diet data, it was not. However, a closer analysis f showed that it is actually mostly coastal diet data which were available and a program to sample sealed diet compositions in offshore area showed the reverse. Higher percentages of adult caught in the stomachs. Since then, there is the perception, at least in Atlantic Canada, that that is a factor which needs to be considered. If we are looking to the seal pred predatory risk and cot distribution, one of the messages is, if we are looking to the situation here, see a risk in the 70s compared to the distribution of the cod stock. And in most recent years, same exercise, you can see that the stock is actually retracting into deeper water where the risk is less. What does that mean is actually that cod changes distribution to reduce predation risk and that the predation process by seals is non-linear that matters really to know for projections. Southern Gulf of St. Lawrence has also been hypothesized to have an interaction which has influenced recruitment, predation on early life stages by pelagic fish. We see the recruitment rate, that is the production of recruits per unit of spawning stock biomass in blue, in red, the biomass of pelagic fish. If one looks to the time scale of the development, it fits. It's at least not contradicting the hypothesis. One thing which is actually making it likely that that hypothesis is correct is that we see in similar estuarine areas the same process, both in the Black Sea and in the Baltic. You have the same phenomenon. Reason is relatively simple. It is that the early life stages are, distribu sorry, are distributed across the water column. They are not floating in upper water layers. So they are accessible to the pelagic fish as prey. Quantification of this is extremely difficult. We need new tools, for example, genetics, to figure out how much is actually in the diet. Going to the northern Gulf of St. Lawrence, nutritional condition has been argued to have an impact on mortality. It's a relatively complicated figure. On the left side, we see the distribution, frequency distribution of nutritional condition as Fulton's K factor after spawning compared to fish 
staffed and experiments. On this side, we see the same thing, but fish were fed in the experiments. If one is comparing this frequency with this, one is getting an idea about that after spawning and winter, the frequency distribution is basically lying between those staff and close to death and those which are fed well. In summer, in the feeding period, the overlap is getting better. So that means actually that they are catching up, but they are not able to catch up to well-fed cod. Condition factors below 0.66 were classified as severe starvation below 0.22 ended in mortality. Nutrition uh, condition is associated with water temperature. Here we see condition factor and different water temperature layers in the Gulf. It is related to oxygen concentration, which is of course also a problem in an estuarine system like this. And here we see actually that the growth is affected through reduced food consumption at low oxygen concentrations. Growth is, in addition, negatively related to mortality, age and maturation, and positively related to fecundity. That gives an indication that these processes are interacting. Coming to the Baltic. The Baltic looks pretty much like the Gulf of St. Lawrence. In the beginning, I had actually a joke to make a test whether you would be able to see the difference. There is a difference, though. The last analytical accepted assessment shows an increase at the end of the time series, which is actually confirmed sorry, by catch rates from trawl surveys. And that is what we see here which was considered as an indication for recovery. However, after 2010, the catch rates from the service was going down. The assessment successively revised the estimate of stocks downwards. And in 2014, the assessment broke down. Simply, the input data was not available to conduct a reliable assessment. What hampers recovery? in Baltic cod. If we are looking to the distribution of the stock, then the distribution is clearly concentrating on the south, southern central areas. The red dots here are trawl tracks without any cod. That is an example from the International Bottom Trawl Survey, but it looks relatively consistent throughout the years. Historical spawning sites were the Bornholm Basin, the Goatland Basin and the Gdansk Deep. If we are looking to the abundance of larvae produced in these three basins, then we can see that it is mainly the Bornholm Basin who is, which is sustaining the production. So if we are talking spawner loss or loss of spawner components, then the answer is likely yes. What that means for recolonization? Good question. I am having a little bit of a problem with that thing here. Sorry for that. If we are looking to the hydrography in the last 30 years, then we have in the last 30 years had five major Baltic inflows from the Western Baltic and the North Sea, introducing fresh and saline water. That is considerably less in the periods before. Does that imply no recruitment in the eastern basins because of lack of oxygen and the eggs floating in oxygen depleted zone. When looking to the last assessment, the recruitment per spawning stock biomass has actually increased quite a bit from the 1990s onwards until 2010. So despite the absence of major Baltic inflows, it looks like that the stock has recruited in the last years. If we are looking to what is driving the process of recruitment despite the lack of Baltic inflows, then we can see here 
that we have catch rates of juvenile fish down here, first and fourth quarter, larval abundances, and egg survival. And it is so that the outstanding year classes, 2000, 2003, 11, and 12, are related to high or intermediate larval abundances, and the same in relation to egg survival. If we are looking into that plot we have seen before and try to identify what has happened, then one of the things which has happened is that the egg production increased not only in summer, also in spring. So spawning season extended. The egg survival got up due to minor inflows into the Baltic, both in winter and as a new feature also in summer. Egg predation by clupeids was going down because the clupeids were distributed differently than the cod. Prey availability in zooplankton was going up at least until 2010, and the stock used obviously different windows for survival. So, in principle, the processes are identified and confirmed that the stock has actually recruited, the relative importance is unclear. If we are looking to condition and growth, then we see a clear-cut decline in condition from the 1990s until now. Mean weight at age as a measure of growth is following relatively closely. That had an impact on the size distribution. Here, a catch from the International Bottom Trawl Survey in the 80s. And if we are looking to the same trawl track, same ship, different investigator, then it looks like this. It is not only so that the size composition of the stock has changed, it is also that the size at attaining maturity has changed. It has reduced concurrently to the reduced growth. We are down to 20 centimeter of average size at attaining maturity in Baltic cod. That's not a herring, that is a cod. 25 centimeters for, male, uh, for females. If one is coupling that to the low condition, then it is quite likely that we are at the moment seeing an effect as well on fecundity, because we know that fecundity is related to condition, and offspring survival. Because it is known that smaller females are produced on average at least smaller eggs, being less buoyant and dying to a higher rate to oxygen depletion. So the question is that recruitment we have seen, will that continue? And the answer is, if we are looking to the latest information from the Asia Plankton Service in 2013 to 15, no, likely not. But one should also say that these interactions here are not very well studied. That is an area which need to be closer investigated. What is affecting nutrition and condition, certainly fish prey. If we are looking to the distribution of fish prey, first of all spread, then we see what I have already said before, that the distribution of spread is quite different from cod. Same is actually true for herring. If we are looking to the total spread biomass available for cod, then the trend looks like that, with extremely low values in the 2000s. Second thing, if we are looking to the size distribution, I very much doubt that herring is actually still a suitable prey for cod. Looking to bentos and hydrography, which is coupled. Going into diet composition, or diet content, and then energy intake calculated here shows a clear downward trend with low values in the 2000s. If 
we are looking to the ratio of benthic pelagic food, a clear downward trend, meaning a lower proportion of benthic food. And that can have direct and indirect effects from hypoxia. As we know from the other side of the Atlantic, it is directly affecting growth, nutritional condition, but it is of course also affecting macrozoa bentos, the food. If we are looking to the development of hypoxic and anoxic areas in the Baltic, there is a clear cut trend from mid 1990s into 2000s of increase, and that is accompanied by temperature increase here, the bottom temperature. And that does it not make it better. If we are going to another relatively new factor, then it is seals. We can see an increasing abundance of liverworms in seals. Infected are smaller and larger cod. Horbury et al. in 2016 made a study where they are trying to investigate has it an impact on condition. And it is so. The intensity of infestation is related to condition. They are also interpreting the downward limb of this curve as an increase in mortality. That is confirmed that we might have actually a direct link as in the stocks on the Canadian side between condition and mortality. I would say this is definitely an understudy area where diseases and parasitation and their impact on stock dynamic is not very well understood and it is of course not included into any stock assessment. Sum it up in relation to ecological drivers of condition. Here the downward trend in points again. Spread availability going down, temperature going up, oxygen going down, bentos going down, seals going up. So a multitude of different changes in the ecosystem which had an impact on condition and growth. And it is clear, if one wants to study the effects, as well with coming with projections on what is coming next, one needs to know the interactions. What about mortality? We see here an assessment output which is showing that the fishing mortality has sharply dropped in the second half of the 2000s. Natural mortality was kept constant at 0.2 in the assessment. We have heard about seals. We see that seal abundance has increased from the 1990s to now by at least a factor of three. I must admit that I think that this thing is actually having a problem. I'm doubting that I am making so many mistakes. <laughs> what one is seeing in the part of the figure which is missing here is actually the historic stock size of seals, which is actually 100,000. Does it have an impact on mortality? Now, not by a condition, but direct predation. Here the gray seal abundance in the Baltic and the distribution. Gray seals are distributed to the east and to the north. In the southern part we have about three and a half thousand, which is increasing. How much are they eating? About three thousand tons of corn. It does not sound to me like a lot. If one is making a comparison of seal density from the southern Gulf of St. Lawrence to the Baltic, then one also gets the impression why. And that is because the density in the southern Gulf of St. Lawrence is 20 times higher than in the Baltic. We have 0.1 seal per square kilometer. They have two. So it is no wonder that the direct consumption is actually not a major factor. What happens if we have 100,000 seals? I don't know. Another thing is low condition as 
source of natural mortality. We have seen that from the Canadian stocks. Does it also have an impact here? So what Cassini et al. have done is simply applied the starvation thresholds to the condition data from the Baltic and calculated what that means in mortality. It is adding to mortalities from the baseline of 0.2 to about 0.3 to 0.4. Does not sound like a lot, but if we are looking into the deviation in assessments, then we can see that it means a deviation of 25% in calculated spawning stock biomass and a further reduction of fishing mortality by 40% compared to the last assessment. I think it is a good example of making use of information from another stock, which I will come up in the summary as something which we should do more. Going a little bit back in time, condition has declined. Have we seen these type of situations before in the Baltic? Data compiled by the institute here is showing, yes, condition has been lower, especially in periods of high stock size around 1980. If we are taking the Bornholm data on top of it, then there is quite some variability, but also some low values in the 1950s. So, question, have we seen these situations before? Going back into the archives, In 1971, Turo estimated on the basis of the available checking data natural mortalities of 0.44 and 0.3 for the stock. The assessment working group has used in the 70s 0.4 and 0.3. In 1986, decided after a review to reduce it to 0.2, meaning they state explicitly nutritional condition and hydrography have improved in the period Therefore, we assume a lower mortality, which was then confirmed by a study made by the Polish Institute. So, in short, don't forget the history. The process has been there before. To try to sum it up, changes in ambient conditions for cod. Hydrography, if we are looking to the 70s and 80, to until 85, hydrography is actually showing quite some inflow situations. Recruitment of cod was high, benders was available, seals were no problem, fish prey was relatively low. If we are going into the 1990s to 2005, prevailing stagnation, recruitment failure, benders reduction, fish prey goes up, especially spread, seals still low. In the last years, stagnation, but nevertheless recruitment, However, bentos is going down, fish prey is going down, seals are going up. So we are ending up in a situation where the stock is actually recruiting, confined to a very restricted area. We are starting to see density-dependent processes which are acting on condition growth, which results in an increasing aging problems, which is the basic reason that we have no assessment. Length at maturity with negative effects on offspring, question mark. Survival is declining despite moderate f fishing pressure. And it is also now relatively clear what we need to do. First, to get the aging right. Then I would like to make a reference to a theme session H, where we are presenting a new promising method. And then disentangle the effect of mortality and growth via attacking program. So, and now I'm summing up, really, the overarching part of the story. Processes impacting on fish stock dynamics. Where are we? They interlink within and across life stages. They affect individuals, groups, metapopulations, stocks, as well as ecosystems. They act on spatial scales, which are small to large, as well, time scales. Our stock assessment hardly considers the early life stage dynamics, substock structure, finer spatial and temporal scale dynamics and available processes. However, 
it functions if ecological changes are limited and fisheries is the main driver. We are certainly not living up to the challenge put by Terence Quinn that our assessment should reflect the processes which are acting. There we have an open session on Wednesday which is looking in how science can be used to improve assessment and advice. Process knowledge is needed to quality assure data input and interpret assessment output. So even if we don't need it to run the assessments, we need to interpret them. Predict future, no doubt we need them. Define management targets in a changing world and evaluate the effect of management measures. What do we have? What does ISIS have? A long-term institutional knowledge, long time series, undigitized data and unprocessed samples. And I think we have heard it in the Laudatia for Peter earlier. That's important. Process knowledge on various life stages and species. Progress in observation technology and application of molecular biology. And we have a whole toolbox of models individual models to ecosystem models, multi-species stock assessment models. We are developing spatial models as well now. So that is the strong side of ISIS. What do we need to do? In studying these interlinked processes which are driving our fish stocks, we need a combination of empirical analysis, controlled laboratory experiments, adequately scaled field experiments, process modeling, and then use the process models in our stock assessment and larger ecosystem models. And the most important thing, we need to address the important processes at the same time and not separate. Finally, no doubt this requires funding for process-oriented research, which has declined. We need to have funding sources which are not promising a revolution in management at once. That takes time. Utilizing knowledge across geographical areas and species, I hope I have shown that with Canada and the other areas in the Baltic. Enhance cooperation with other research areas. Integrated regional monitoring systems, which are observing these different changes and the different interlinked system components. And then access to samples and data information. There's a theme session on that. Theme session O on monitoring, would like also to make a reference there. And then, the last thing, collaboration and communication is key, and ISIS is the place to be. Thank you. Big thank you to Fritz for being uh, so outspoken to uh, look at our stock assessment in this uh, critical perspective, comparing it to uh, earlier situations of decreasing stocks across the uh, Atlantic, but also for coming forward with so clear recommendations for uh, how we should uh, improve our work. I know that Fritz is, uh, would like very much to answer questions, but uh, due to time uh, limitations, we will be doing that uh, uh, during the, um, the coffee break. And for me, there is only now uh, to state to you uh, that uh, this little booklet, that's going to be very important for you, because this is where you can find information about the 18 theme sessions, where they are taking place and, and when. Um, Please also remember the information about all the social events and early career scientists uh, events and to buy a ticket for the conference dinner uh, on Thursday. Um, and please remember to enjoy. 
So the AC is open, starting with a coffee break, and then the theme sessions will be starting at uh, 3 o'clock. Thank you very much. <laughs>